This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. This talk is with Emma Smith, professor of English at Hartford College, Oxford, and will focus on her many contributions to Shakespearean scholarship and education. If you are joining us on YouTube and wish to listen to this program as a podcast, you may click the link below to your favorite podcast platform. If you are joining us via a podcast and wish to watch this program, we are available on YouTube under the search term, Speaking of Shakespeare. This series is funded with institutional support from Aoyama Gakuin University and with the help of a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Hello, Emma Smith. How are you? I'm really well, Tom. How are you? I'm doing great. There's so much I want to lead with, but I, I, I notice in other programs that sometimes I get a little bit too um, uh, chummy at first, and we get, uh, sometimes people want to hear what you're doing right off the bat. So, Let's do that. And uh, most recently for you is This is Shakespeare. That's your most recent book out there. And I'm going to ask you about that in just a moment. But what, what I want to start with is what, where I see you going. One of the elements of your, in, uh, your career is what I want to call uh, reflexivity in, in all the best ways, in the sense that you look at the Shakespearean period, you're very interested in consumer culture and things that were popular and what Shakespeare did for outreach, how Shakespeare marketed himself. You see them as active uh, working, uh, a company, a, a real company of playwrights. And then it, it reflects back onto your own work and other works that you've done where you do your own outreach to uh, spread the word really to people beyond the halls of academe. And so you have this combination of rigorous scholarship, the, the most rigorous type of scholarship, archival, and then you will turn around, <clears throat> and I'm a little jealous of this actually, because this is excellent the way you do it, and speak, uh, I don't wanna call it, uh, you know, to, to people outside the halls of academe who are not been trained in the critical language. And I just wanted to express my appreciation for the, the, your, your ability to do that. It's, a, it's an art. But let's move on to This is Shakespeare and uh, what readers could expect from that book. Well, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, so, so This is Shakespeare is probably the book that's most, you know, fulfills that kind uh, summary. It's actually based on my undergraduate lectures um, and it's got 20 shortish chapters each on a single play and overall I'm trying to uh, say something which is completely standard actually in the uh, in, in academic discourse which is that there are multiple interpretations always available um, that none of us knows or should even try to look for you know what Shakespeare meant or you know a single meaning to pin down these plays what we should be enjoying and looking for and in, in sort of introducing other people to is the kind of permissiveness the openness the openness to um, the openness to different interpretations and that that helps with some contemporary discussions about things like casting of Shakespeare's plays which is quite controversial um, it, I think it can help with those discussions if we get away from a sense that there was an original um, sort of fixed version that we are somehow spoiling or, or straying away from. So that's what the book does. I try to write in a, I, I try to write accessibly without being patronizing, partly because I'm saying one of the things academics tend to do, and of course we do this, is to suggest really to understand these things, you need to know a lot. You know, you really, you need to do your, you know, you need to do your time. You need to, you know, have the chops to do it. You need to know this complicated stuff about textual transmission or about the kind of religious uh, upheavals of Shakespeare's time or something. And of course, that's all um, illuminating and sort of vital material, but it can be a kind of gatekeeping. Mm -hmm. um, and I've tried to sort of push, push beyond that a bit, uh, a bit in the book. And it's drawn a lot from... Um, I suppose the thing that I have most enjoyed about Shakespeare in my career is the fact that there are Shakespeareans outside the academy in a way that there aren't really 
um, uh, I don't know, um, s s s students of, let's think, oh, well, you know, you can, you can think what the alternative would be, but there are, uh, you know, deeply knowledgeable or engaged Shakespearean, particularly in the theatre, but in sc in schools, you know, there are lots of teachers of Shakespeare. There's an in international, as we as we see from this conversation, you know, there's an international interest in Shakespeare. Um, the this is an enormously um, generative and generous conversation because there's so many people in it, uh, and it's it's great to have, you know have a, have a toe in it really. Yeah, I've never um, been the kind of academic who would be the world expert in one thing. Yeah, yeah. because I probably if I were that, I would just I would just make it up. Um, <laughs> who would know? Um, and I don't know who I would talk who I would talk with. I think yeah. if you're the world expert, you're always in you're always broadcasting and 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 helping other people understand what you understand. But you're not really can't really be so much in conversation. And conversation seems to me the heart of the discipline that we're in, as I understand it. Yeah, well, I'm thinking of many examples, but one for, uh, that comes to the uh, forefront right now, uh, being uh, in Stratford, Ontario, not uh, in Stratford-upon-Avon, mm -hmm. but in Ontario, where they have a very big you know, Shakespeare sort of, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it cottage industry. They have theaters in the town, and uh, mm -hmm. I was there for a conference, and I uh, was at a restaurant and spoke to this uh, couple. Uh, we we're at a cafe and they had driven in from Detroit, which is not that far away. And he was uh, the owner of a car dealership and had no real formal training in Shakespeare, but he and his wife, uh, they, they uh, admitted that they come frequently. And this is, uh, you know, it's a beautiful town in the summer and so forth. And those are the types of people you do want to reach. Those are, and there's so many of them out there. Mm. And in your book, you talk about uh, gappiness. Hmm. And uh, you did a podcast with uh, uh, Barbara Bogave for the Folger Library. So I don't want to spend too much time on that because you go into some depth about that concept. But the gappiness in Shakespeare, where we're not, where Shakespeare, Shakespearean plays are, are not finished. Uh, in a sense, that there, there are things that we can bring to it to, to complete. And if you could give us a couple of examples of, uh, of gappiness in, in Shakespeare. Yeah, so I think gappiness was the, was the way I was trying to uh, make a space for us in these, um, in these plays. And I was trying to um, conceptualize the, the open-endedness, open often literally, often it's the endings of Shakespeare's plays that we're not completely sure uh, what to do with. Uh, in the book, I talk a lot about the ending of The Taming of the Shrew, where um, uh, Catherine, who's the shrew of the title, she may or may not have been tamed by her husband, Petruchio. She delivers a long speech about women's obligation to their husbands. And she ends by saying that she uh, will put her hand under her husband's foot. Uh, and there's no stage direction that says, you know, how does she deliver this? How, is that uh, ironic? Is that submissive? Uh, and then he has probably one of the most famous lines, thanks to the musical in Shakespeare, come on and kiss me, Kate. Yeah. And most editors of the play will put in a stage direction that says they kiss, yeah. um, but there's no stage direction uh, in, yeah. in in Shakespeare's uh, text, and that that just that's a gap that leaves a gap for us to think what 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 happens at the end and what's um, how does that make the play uh, speak to our own world uh, at this point? Yeah. So often gappiness is a is a sort of consequence of of seeing these plays perhaps a little bit more as, as scripts. Once, once you start to, to use the word script, you, you don't expect that everything, every meaning of the play will, will, it, will inhere in, in the words on the page. Um, but we've, we've been a bit reluctant to think of Shakespeare's plays as scripts because yeah. um, uh, I, I guess we were trained uh, early on, perhaps by the first folio in 1623 to think of them as things, as literary works to read. Yeah. Well, uh, we're going to talk about the first folio in a bit. Uh, the Japanese uh, playwright from the you know no Kabuki era, the famous uh, Zayami, uh, did the great cultural service of writing down precisely how to do every play, and as such, the 
performance of a no play or kabuki play or whatnot follows some extraordinarily strict guidelines. That's part of the art. You, know, you cannot derivate from uh, mm. the original production. And Shakespeare <laughs> gives nothing of the sort. It's absolutely, uh, and, and so, absolutely you know, every encounter with Shakespeare, uh, and I don't want to uh, in any way depreciate the art of Zayami, but the uh, but the opening and what you're calling the gaps between what you get is a script and then how a creative, a director and an actor and a group can interact with this script and bring their own create creativity uh, to the fore. And we as readers also can, can do the same thing. We can insert what we want. And that, you know, you really have to be serious to go to a no drama. But Shakespearean productions, uh, even in Tokyo, are just extremely popular. And of course, you know, in the UK and throughout uh, North America, all through the world. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of, I just taught Midsummer Night's Dream and used that film mm -hmm. uh, where, and you know, Bottom gets wine poured on his head in uh, the film version that I used. And that's not mm -hmm. in the script, that somebody made that up and he sort of publicly humiliated. Mm -hmm. And the director brought that in and it works, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and it reminds me of the Rhinish poured on the head of the grave digger from Yorick or whatever back then. So it, it is a sort of Shakespearean, Mm -hmm. uh, illusion but uh mm -hmm. it's there's nothing in the script about it and those things are okay you can just bring those things are out. great i think actually i mean i think um particularly in performance in film or in theater directors need to um you know make 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 this make the script mean in in our own context that seems to me what they're doing so i'm a bit of a sort of shakespeare heretic i actually very much like things that are cut i think cutting is a very helpful way to make these plays move. Um, uh, I don't feel horrified by that. Oh, oh of, of course, there are things, you know, by definition, there are things that you leave out and there are, there, you know, there are losses in that, but there, is, there are gains as well. Um, so yeah, I, I, um, I think people, when I started to work with theatre companies, which is one of the really interesting things that I sometimes get the opportunity to do. I think I go into the rehearsal room and people think, oh, you know, they think that I'm going to come in and say, this is, uh, you know, the, the, every single word of this is absolutely vital and meaningful and you must do it all. And in fact, I'm saying I would, yeah, that, leave that, you know, that's fine. Leave, you know, we can just cut, we can cut that. That's absolutely fine. So I, I do think that Shakespeare, one of the words I use in the book is permissive. And I think partly because most of us encounter Shakespeare first in educational settings where we have to get whatever approximates to the right answer. Um, we don't tend to think of the Shakespeare being permissive. We think of it being actually quite regimented. Um, uh, but, but I think it really is. And that's where the life, that's where the life of it is. Yeah. And uh, what a wonderful thing for you to do, to uh, to do the outreach, I guess, is uh, what we call it now, the outreach and uh, making contact with the public. Uh, this is the it's not a trend. I think it's something that's going to set in. Uh, when I think of what you're doing, I think of the uh, the, the wonderful Western wing, the, uh, the the newer newer wing of the Bodleian. And I joked with uh, uh, Pip Wilcox in a prior uh, conversation about the first time me as a 22 year old graduate student uh, entered the Bodley and, and feeling incredibly intimidated, right? Mm. Uh, and once I got in, everybody was just wonderful. Mm. But up front, it was uh, very wow. officious. And so- But I think uh, we're trying to sort of turn turn those things sort of a, a bit more, um, turn them a bit, make them a bit more public facing, you know, that the new, the new sort of the architecture of the new building in the Bodleian Library in Oxford sort of really tries to embody that, as you're saying, you know, it's got a big open entrance hall with lots of free exhibitions and a cafe. And it's really, you know, trying to say rather than those, that very wonderful secret sense of being admitted into a secret staircase. Um, yeah. uh, but that was only for the initiates, wasn't it? And I think, yes. um, and certainly in a place like Oxford, I mean, my career has been almost entirely in the University of Oxford, uh, and I've been very fortunate to do that. And Oxford is a is a wonderful uh, place to be. It's a place with a in the in the British imagination with a very long and some would say sort of continuing history of sort of elitism that's um, social rather than intellectual. Yeah. And so you know we we've got work to, we've got ongoing work to do, which is to you know uh, open up. The resources of the university to the to a wider world you know our universities are all public in the uk we do have a kind of public facing uh, mission in a way and, and we've got to work to get 
a broader range of, in our case, still mostly young people. It's young people who come to be undergraduates. We don't have a very mixed age range, but getting those people from it from different backgrounds in the yeah. still rather class stratified British system, a, a divided education system. That's a big job of work. So um, I do think that that being turned, you know, outward, particularly for the humanities is a really important you know, it, it's really important. You know, my university developed, you know, one of the vaccines. That's wonderful for the That's university, right. but it becomes a bit more difficult sometimes in a way to say, well, why are you fiddling about with Shakespeare? You know, yes. <laughs> there's important stuff to do. But, you know, the, 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 and I don't know that the, this is probably going off our topic, but I think some of the really um, sort of sceptical, properly sceptical work about those old things we used to say about the humanities, you know, they make us better people, they develop empathy and those things. I can see why those were problems and they were, that was a kind of lazy thinking, but I think in the course of that, we haven't always, certainly in my context, made a very good case for what the, you know, what the humanities do do. Yeah. yeah. Um, and instead we're sort of trying to say, oh, people who do humanities degrees still get jobs in banking and that's great you know pro probably yeah. some of them do but that that can't be you know that can't be the only the only role so that's a long way of saying yeah you're you're the car dealer who you met in, in Stratford I think that that's a great reminder that um uh people do want to know about the stuff that we um are finding out and the ideas that we're developing and they're um you know perfectly capable sometimes we underestimate how yeah. You know, how able they are to sort of get on board with that. Yeah, well, uh, some years ago, I, I, and I still am, but some years ago I, I wrote on this. And uh, I, if you take the reverse view, right? You say, okay, let's just take it out. All right, let's just not teach Shakespeare at Harvard. Let's not teach Shakespeare at uh, a, you know another university that uh, isn't Harvard. Does the you know status of the university go up? Do people feel better about the university? And I, I think there's always been, it has always been, for hundreds of years, public demand for Shakespeare. People want Shakespeare. Now you can argue, well, we don't need to spend you know resources. Uh, you know that's a hobby. That's like trout fishing or or mm -hmm. something uh, of that nature. And you go, no, people want the public want Shakespeare, and they want Shakespeare in the university. And, uh, and I, I think that if you took it away, there would be a public outcry. I think that's and, right. And it's so interesting um, to see in lockdown, what did people, when people's lives were very stripped down from, you know, some of the sort of stresses of work, some of the stresses of commuting, you know, spending time out, what, what did they, what, what did they want to do? And many of them, we you know, wanted to read, uh, were interested in, you know, poetry that was being, you know, read daily, were looking uh, online at different kinds of entertainment, uh, the, the, you know, lots, lots more people went to theatre streamings than probably would have gone to live theatre. So, yeah, one of my, uh, I always remember one of my colleagues who's the head of our medical sciences division, he, he, uh, he always used to say to me, yeah, it's our job to, um, it's, it's our job to make life long, you know, longer, and it's your job to, fill that up you know yeah. make that meaningful why should life be longer yeah uh, just and, you know and hobbies you know even I, it, it's saying it's just a hobby I don't think that's such a bad thing you know that no, that's it's not it, a bad you know, thing at all it's not it's you know it's so I so I, I'm I mean I'm not I'm not a I think there are some very um sort of brilliant defenders of the humanities and I'm not as articulate about that as I should be um, and in some ways, I suppose I'm trying to do my bit of that by do, doing it, just doing it by Shakespeare um, yeah. and letting the broader point. Yeah, well, that's that's a pretty big uh, platform. Shakespeare is a pretty big platform to work from. And uh, I'm, and I'm so happy you're doing it. I, I try well, this series and in, uh, in its way is an uh, attempt to do Absolutely. just that. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and I think, it, you know, it's, a, it's been very well received, mm -hmm. uh, better than I thought, uh, than I thought it was, you know, by people who are not, uh, you know, Shakespearean is Shakespearean is proper, or, you know, they may mm -hmm. be a, other forms in academe, but also uh, gen in, uh, in the general public, uh, it has some wonderful, um, mm -hmm. wonderful feedback. And, uh, but what I, I want to do in every one of these uh, podcasts is to, and video um, YouTube thingies, is to uh, talk about what's upcoming. And I noticed on your website that you have Nash and Twelfth Night 
and merry wives and portable magic and you can choose from that menu you <laughs> you are into a so lot. do you know what um one of the things that i realize i'm trying now to do in my career is to alternate or to keep both strands going so that if i have the space or the platform or the authority to talk more widely about shakespeare for me it's got to be based on doing new work myself that's not necessarily of interest of wider interest but that you know keeps me uh i i do in i do enjoy the job of sort of uh um promulgating or kind of uh broadcasting in a way other other people's ideas i hope properly um you know pro properly uh you know, given to them and and attributed to them, but I also got to be doing my own work. So, yeah. the stuff that you've listed is the, the three sort of quite intensely scholarly projects. One is with the um, brilliant uh, Elizabethan sort of satirist and mostly known as a prose writer, Thomas Nash. Nash, we have become interested in because perhaps he collaborated with Shakespeare uh, on the first part of Henry the Sixth and perhaps the others, the other parts too. Um, and he's always in the background of other plays. You know, he, he collaborated with Johnson on a play which was very controversial and which we don't now have. Um, he's on the title page of um, uh, Marlowe's, the play we attribute mostly to Marlowe, Dido, Queen of Carthage. So his role as a playwright is, is a bit shadowy, but he does have this one pageant-like play called Summer's Last Will and Testament, uh, which I'm editing for a complete works uh, edited by lots of scholars um, of Thomas Nash's uh, work. So that's a really different kind of rabbit hole kind of scholarship. You know, it's it's following up, trying to work out, you know, what, what does he mean here? What's the illusion here? What's been lost that would have been recognisable to first audiences? Um, how to annotate this and how to present it for a uh, for, for for scholars to 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 use. So that's and been a, that's a great ongoing project. Uh, which you, I'm you've enjoying. you've chosen you've chosen perhaps from an annotation standpoint one of the hardest uh, figures. Nash is impossibly difficult to yeah. explain to someone else. You know, the he really essays. is, and it's impossibly difficult yeah. to understand. Often the play is a little bit more straightforward, I think, than yeah. some of the very 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 complicated prose prose works. Yeah. But Nash, yeah. it's worth sort of pushing on with that because I think Nash was so influential in in his in his own time I think he was really the sort of writer's writer if you like he's obviously really I mean not only does he work with Shakespeare but he's really influential I think on Shakespeare um and there's a you know an argument that Shakespeare's a lot of Shakespeare's wordplay is a is is Nashian or is, is sort of imitating Nash um so it's a completely different activity from um, the the activity of sort of, of of at the moment the the sort of public facing activity um, yeah. and then I've uh, uh, I oh, maybe I'll just talk about Mary Wives because 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 that is an important part of my recent work has been um, co collaborating um, most recently and extensively with my colleague Laurie Maguire yeah yeah and that's a really been a really great wonderful uh, thing for me it's not so common in the humanities of course it's a completely standard model in the sciences yeah but the humanities has tended to favor sort of single single author work and because Laurie and I are working broadly on ideas about how dramatic authors in our period collaborate yeah. we've been trying to sort of reflect back it's back to that reflexivity yes that's you, it you yes. so cleverly identified which i hadn't quite thought before yeah collaborating um, about collaboration yeah that's right yeah. we've been trying to sort of leverage that a bit to think about um yeah. uh, forms of collaboration but the work on mary wives of windsor is um uh te textual work on the difference between the two texts of the play mm -hmm. so it's quite um uh, technical but it's in the it's in the field of P partly, um, did Shakespeare revise his plays? I suppose mm. that's the, the larger question. And the, the more reflexive version of that is, why have we been so unwilling to think that he did? Um, or to make a step forward, there was a big, um, move, big movement in Shakespeare studies when uh, it was argued very strongly that the two texts of King Lear represented two authorial stages 
not some problem in the printing house and not some version of uh, a, a sort of transmission failure, but two distinct stages, both of which had authority, but represented different sort of moments in the life of the play. Um, and that was very sort of controversial, but has become a, a pretty standard, not, not entirely agreed, but a pretty standard view. But we haven't sort of really extended beyond that to think, you know, why would he do it for King Lear yeah. um, and not for anything else? And we've argued that um, uh, he does it for Merry Wives of Windsor. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the impossible, the, the impossible scenario of putting on a play publicly and having it performed and then reviving it in some way and saying, OK, um, it was perfect the first time. Yeah. Yeah. How, how could that possibly be? Yeah, and I mean, anybody who's been anywhere near theatres knows that, you know, <clears throat> you know, there are working scripts for, for different productions and different different moments. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so portable magic. Yeah, so portable magic is a different bit of a different direction. And this we're, co we're coming up on Halloween as we're talking yeah. now. Yeah. So I'm yeah, well, that's interesting. Yeah. So the title comes from um uh, a lovely uh, um essay memoir that Stephen King, the horror writer, has about which is called On Writing. It's just quite a throwaway remark. He says, books are a uniquely portable magic. Um, and so I've taken that as a as a, um, uh, as a title to think about books um, and particularly to think I, I've just about finished I've just I'm just on the last revisions of this of this book um, it, it's about uh, it's really about what, what the academy calls book history what, what does the material book the actual book as an object how does that influence how's that changed over time but also how does it influence the reading of the texts within so it's a way of saying the literary it's almost the opposite of this is Shakespeare the literary text does not sort of float free from the material forms in which we encounter it and so I'm I'm sort of trying to think about those uh, book history which particularly in my university at back to the wonderful library is a very sort of prominent academic um, discipline how could uh, s sort of work with uh, the wide uh, array of digital uh, versions, digital facsimiles, online facsimiles of, of wonderful books to um, to encourage a sort of wider readership to think about those issues. Yeah, well, I'm a big believer now, maybe five years ago I wasn't, but I'm a big believer now that the uh, death of the book was greatly exaggerated. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of evidence in Japan among uh, my younger students and so forth. Uh, now, it may not have the prevalence that it had. It may be something like vinyl records, you know, in the future, uh, you know, recovery uh, kind of, uh, again, a hobbyist recovery of what used to be called this thing, the book. But I don't think so. Uh, and you're in uh, Oxford, you know, next to the Western Wing is Blackwell's. And the book is doing just fine. Uh, it, the book it, is doing yeah. just fine. And there's, yeah. a, there's been a little, I've been, yeah, I, I agree. It's been very, very interesting. The death of the book has, um, yeah, be, been a bit exaggerated. Been a little bit of a, 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 a sort of uptake in ebooks during lockdown. But broadly speaking, they have fallen from the peak that was in about 2000 and 14, 13, 14, something like that. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, one of the things I was interested in is how much um, ebook readers, uh, you know, from Amazon and from other providers, how closely they actually mimic books. Yeah. Yeah. So they haven't yeah. really given us what's so interesting about that whole technology is I think we thought in the perhaps in the 90s or early 2000s, this is going to absolutely transform the kinds of sort of um, interactive texts that people will have and we'll have these sort of enhanced digital books which will do so much more than a regular book. And in fact, there has been, you know, the, the, the attempts to um, produce those have com completely fallen flat. What people want is a lighter, slightly bigger print book that they can take on holiday or read on the tube or you know enlarge the font and use backlight and not wake their partner up in bed or something they want those things but mm -hmm. they actually don't want bells and whistles and hyperlinks and all, no. all of that so they really just want the text of a book perhaps in a slightly more in some six, six circumstances a more convenient form so the so so ebooks have done nothing for 
uh, unlike all, almost all the other technological advances in the book, they've sort of done nothing to the content, which is a, right. kind of interesting. They're, they're quite a static, uh, right. quite a static form. I'm not, I'm not actually against them at all. And I have a Kindle that I take on holiday, I find very convenient. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I don't have a, a sort of, I'm not on a crusade against, against them, um, but they are, um, as you say, they were thought to be the future. And I think they're not, they're actually not really. Well, in a conversation with Tiffany Stern, she said, you know, that the, the Arden, and you're working with uh, the Arden series also, uh, that they're kind of, I don't know if this has been a hard decision, but basically you're not going to try online to make the book a museum. And there's a word she used. And I thought that was good because you can find things very quickly now, if you need to find, you know, the etymology of a word or that sort of thing. And uh, I, I thought, well, yeah, i I'm okay if you can give me the click, just like really in Wik Wikipedia, you know, the click from the note to the footnote, and then click back to what the text that would that would help me a lot. Uh, and that is basically what happens when these books are digitized now. Uh, and I've seen some good examples of that recently. And I think that that's enough. Uh, I, I do like having the notes close at hand. And uh, and I have a yeah, agree. absolutely, absolutely agreed. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I want to go back a little ways with you, and I wanted to uh, praise you. I, I I followed you for years now, but I really got on board with the uh, Elizabethan top ten, the the uh, edition you did with Andy Kesson. I it was a turning point for me. And I think, you know, we have a group uh, from my university that comes over in the summer. And I think I saw you on uh, the street at one point and I was complimenting you. You were busy. You were on holiday, you know, during that time. And I uh, sort of said, hello, thank you for now. I don't have to write uh, whatever 20 pages on the history of popularity because you've done it for me and I can just say go see Emma and she's done it right that introduction to the book was just wonderful for me it was a and and you handled that so well and for our viewers I, you know, the history of this word popular it goes back to uh, before Raymond Williams I think Raymond Raymond Williams said uh, those things that are liked well liked by many people was a quotation <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't do it. And then this whole conversation over years started about, you know, what's the difference between mass and popularity? What's the, you know, what, and you handled that so well. And that, and I don't think you, you probably have not been given enough credit because that was just a wrestling with a bear there. I mean, it was a, a, you know, and so you did it there and the, uh, the uh, articles in that book, are so good and it points out to Shakespeare as a working playwright who in some ways you know it was not the age of Shakespeare you know and, and that that comes out very clearly uh, but the, uh, uh, the the there were analytics in the books digital analytics and all all of those things that are that can provide a foundation for people maybe not like me I'm further along in my career but younger people who are uh, grappling with these sorts of things uh, and I thought that you, you and uh, Andy just did a wonderful job with that. And I just wanted that to be part of this talk. Oh, but, that's, that's yeah. so kind of you, Tom. I mean, it's a really, really interesting topic and it is a lovely collection. Um, Zach Lesser and Alan Farmer did an amazing uh, job of segmenting um, the publishing output yeah. of, the, of the London publishing industry and sort of trying to, and, and they would be the first to say, you know, these categories are sort of difficult to get to, but as a, piece of sort of quantitative analysis it's really extraordinary and one of the things it points out is just how tiny the literary marketplace was compared yeah. to yeah. Uh, religious theological sermon books and law books that's what yeah. everybody's looking at uh I wanted to make sure I know that you uh, have a class to teach. Uh, and so I want to make sure I get all on the 12th night. Yeah. <clears throat> on 12th night. I'm, on 12th I want to come back to 12th <clears throat> night because I just failed as a teacher uh, trying to teach that last uh, our last semester. I'll go into that a little bit later, maybe if we get to it. But I don't want to miss the first folio because you're a first folio person. And we talked to my colleague over here. Uh, uh, Hirohisa Igarashi, and he's just translated Blaney's book from the Folgers. It came out some years ago, but he just translated that into Japanese, making it more widely accessible over here. 
but uh, you work on the reception and, you know, I have a little bit of a background in reception theory. I'm fascinated with the work that you've done, uh, particularly at the, you know, in the 1620s at the, the initial publication of the first folio uh, and, and what you found uh, about the, the initial reception of the first folio. Um, your work on, on Marlowe has been really, uh, maybe I can sort of return the compliment, has been really, you know, f formative in how you, I think it's a, how you can think about uh, the, a, a kind of reputation changing over over time. I mean, that's that's really, really important, important work. And we've somehow, we, we lose the sense of that when um, we, with, perhaps with a figure like Shakespeare, who we assume has been sort of consistently uh, appreciated and, and lauded across across time. Yeah, so um, I'm not really a sort of technical um, book historian like, like Blaney. I mean, Blaney has, has given us so much insight into the way the first folio was put together. Yeah. But what I was interested in instead was the way these books um, carry with them enormous uh, evidence about the ways they were they were used and therefore perhaps about the sort of status or the, the, the approach to them. Yeah. And it's absolutely the case that sort of in the period before, maybe in the, maybe in the long, in, in, in the 17th century, in the rest of the 17th century, um, many, many readers of the first folio annotate and, and add marginalia or underline the parts that they, that they like. Um, and uh, that gives us a, a sort of um, map of the of the hotspots. What's well, so what's interesting is that in all these studies of uh, marginalia and readers marks, if you have one example, it's very very difficult to make any sense of it. Really, mm -hmm. you know, why mm -hmm. did somebody do that? You can't really reconstruct. But if you've got what I tried to do was a a sort of census approach where I looked at as many copies as I could of this book, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. tried to aggregate small bits of data to think, okay, people do do this, people don't do this, people don't tend to work. Uh, this is a big book, the first folio. People, a number of people seem to have started it as if they wanted to go all the way through but given up, which is very recognizable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people don't tend to uh, give the same attention to every part of a play. And it's interesting to think why, why they don't. Um, you know, and there are lots of um, ways that that commonplace in tradition, which was so important for uh, early modern culture, tends to pull out um, sort of purple phrases or, uh, it's in some ways it, it anticipates our interest in Shakespearean quotations, but perhaps um, perhaps with some slightly different ones. So, for example, I looked at um, you know f quotations that are very famous to us now, like uh, from Richard the Third, "A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse." Now nobody underlines that mm. in a in a Shakespeare first folio, presumably because it's not a phrase you could ever imagine yourself using, and so it, it's not useful. Um, as part of that sort of commonplacing um, tradition, whereas you know the Tempest is the first play in the in, yeah. in the book, it, it gets a lot of attention from um, uh, you know eager eager readers. And one of the scenes that I, as a reader of the Tempest in the modern period, I'd never really looked at was the scene uh, where Ferdinand meets Miranda, and he has these actually rather cheesy chat up lines um he's a quite a smooth uh, urbane young man and she, uh and these the, these lines look uh, enormously useful to early readers and they're underlining these like mad thinking you know this is what i will say if i meet a kind of island maiden and you know have to impress her with a one of these drop dead remarks you know they're, they're kind of chat up lines they're early chat up lines mm -hmm. that was quite an interesting form so i love the the the, um, the opportunity um to look at the these books um but also to in part of my work to take us back to a time when people didn't put these books in glass cases and instead 
they had them, they had their candles or their tobacco, which was making marks. They had a wine glass sometimes, which they would put on it off, you know, they were eating or a cat might walk across. You know, these were these were real sort of working books rather than museum objects. And that's a that's a sort of that was an important thing to get back. Yeah, they were used books. They were used uh, books. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They weren't. Um... Uh, rare. Well, I th I mean, what you brought up uh, uh, about the uh, perhaps the younger men uh, looking for, for chat up lines, uh, as you, you said, and I think of Romeo and Juliet uh, and Romeo and his um, uh, fellows, you know, out there uh, in the streets, uh, yep. you know, reading books on sword fighting to uh, find out how to do it. And Juliet telling Romeo she kisses, he kisses. You, by yeah, the you book, kiss by the book. You know, yeah. yeah. Yes. And, uh, what do you think that means, yeah. Tom? Do you think you kiss by the book is you're really, really good? This that's a textbook kiss, yeah. or do you think it means that's a bit of a um, you know sort of bloodless uh, kiss based? I, I never, I I never know which which. I, which well, to go. I, I think in our time, I wouldn't want to be told. Uh, <laughs> no, know. that's right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, that's a good way. That's a very, very good question to ask. I, yeah. I, no, I'm good. in favor, and I'm not. Uh, you know. Uh, I, I'm not married to this idea, but I'm in favor of it being a compliment uh, mm -hmm. in, in some ways, because, uh, you know, kind of in other areas, if you say, you know, he goes by the book, this, uh, there's a kind of compliment in it, but then it's, sometimes yeah. it means, uh, you know, you, you're draconian you're a bit and strict. And, somehow. Yeah, yeah you go by the book and rather than sort of seizing the human yeah. moment or something. But it, it doesn't land, it doesn't land as a romantic line in our time. No. No, uh, no. Yeah, no. that's, uh, well, I, I'm just so interested in the way that you looked at the physical, um, you know, the, the physical, the, the book itself and how it was used and it just, and finding out and seeing how, uh, how people, you, it, it, this is the, one of the great arguments for the humanities, you know, it puts us in touch with us, you know, who we are and uh, where we came from. And uh, that's that's going to be of eternal interest, you know. It, it, you can talk all you want to about kings and queens and uh, battles and uh, you know land, uh, basically borders changing and all of this stuff. But uh, what we're doing here, you know, you can just see somebody who's reading and touching and moving with this text in their house and 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 marking marking it, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it just gives us such a uh, what is it uh, a sense of community with those who. Who came before us? It sounds a little bit lofty, but mm -hmm. I don't think it really is, and it, it uh, it's just wonderful. Well, you say that you haven't done much outreach, but you are, uh, you know, a working scholar doing, you know, Thomas Nash. I mean, not, uh, you know, the Marpolate controversy. I think I read about that once a year to try to refresh my memory, and then forget. The major points I can't I can't keep it in my head this is so complicated yeah. you know I mean, Joe, Joe Black there's a brilliant team doing the Nash and I'm learning such a lot from the meetings that we have um uh Joe Black is doing the Marprelate tracks and I think the edition will will really uh have some really interesting things to say about Nash's role in that and also about you know the the sort of clandestine printing of these um, these tracts. So it's it, it's it's a very very interesting world. I am um, a bit of a spectator in those uh, in, the, in those scholarly discussions. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, learning learning a lot a lot about it. Yeah, but do you you do quite a lot and uh, just a, a search on YouTube. You get out there and you do educational. Uh, 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 not not consulting you you have your lectures available some of your lectures are available this is the series is called approaching shakespeare yeah uh, so it's kind of maybe 30 or so lectures on different shakespeare plays and yeah. another sh smaller series called not shakespeare which is on some well known but not shakespearean uh, early modern early so modern approaching plays. shakespeare i want to get that out there i have uh, mm -hmm. colleagues who will want to uh, mm -hmm. see what you have to say uh, mm -hmm. and you do theater consulting uh, also, yeah, I do. I, I've just um, I've just joined the uh, Royal Shakespeare Company as an associate scholar, which is a great uh, great privilege and, and treat. Wow! So wow. I do a bit of work with them um, on 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 productions and on uh, programming, but also on their education work, which is which is interesting. So one of the projects that we have at the moment uh, is a um, a 
funded project by the Paul Hamlin Foundation to try to uh, evaluate the work, the education work that the RSC do in schools. And I'm interested in that because, I mean, it comes back to um, a theme of this conversation. You know, what, what kinds of value are we uh, able to uh, get Sort of social buy-in for about about the humanities. Where, where where do we think they make a difference? What difference yeah. do they make? Um, how can we how can we quantify that in the terms that seem to matter, which are sort of exam results and so on? But also, how can we develop some more qualitative measures that say you know that, that in some way the, the the benefit of this is is in kind of quality of life points rather than necessarily. Um, only you know reading age or whatever um yeah. yeah so i so i really enjoy um uh work uh work with theater and um I, i've done also one film one film script which was for mary queen of scots josie rock's uh production with saoirse ronan and uh, margot robbie um which was great great fun reading a modern uh, very uh, gifted modern um playwrights uh take on a sort of early early modern English yeah. and I've got one I made one impact only on on that script apart from well I, I kept saying I don't think I don't think we can have this so I had a negative impact saying <laughs> not this not this not this um, but I only had only one positive impact where <laughs> the wonderful David Tennant um, is John Knox in a great big beard and he is delivering a great condemnation of Mary Queen of Scots um uh as a, a sort of loose woman and a and, and a scarlet woman and i had um been at a talk which had had uh, a great sort of word cloud the one that stuck out for me was polecat 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 yes well polecat yes and, and david tennant john knox does call mary queen of scots a polecat uh -huh. and that's my one moment in the film so that's uh that's that's the that's the only thing i and did. you brought so, that word to into the I script put that word, i put that word in the script it's uh it's an American Southern word. I'm from the Southern Is state, it? Uh, but mm -hmm. I remember hearing oldsters say things like that when I was young. Mm -hmm. uh, so it wouldn't be contemporary. It wouldn't be a contemporary mm -hmm. word, but uh, it, I, I think it survived uh, through throughout. Well, it is mm -hmm. wonderful to be able to have that uh, conversation and the uh, <laughs> the uh, John Knox, the the uh, probably the leader in the top tier of people you would not want to go have a beer with. Yes. <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah. what, what possible you know you, you'd be looking at your watch the entire time trying to get yeah, out completely of it. yes <laughs> well so talking about somebody you might want to have a beer with that's christopher marlowe you've done quite a lot of work on christopher marlowe and i that's marlowe it was shakespeare of course but marlowe just turned around everything when i was young and i read tamberlane the great and i thought i mean you know this was during a the you know the, the time when movies now this I'm not quite th this old but there were a string of movies uh, you know Godfather Deer Hunter um, and a Taxi Driver you know that just really pushed the edge of things and I thought oh boy this is really avant garde and then I start reading Tamburlaine the Great and I'm going <laughs> these guys Scorsese is great you know and uh, Coppola is great but this guy is outrageous I mean this. Uh, who did this? You know, who did this? Uh, and then uh, Edward II, uh, with those lines of just this purity that uh, Shakespeare does in Richard II, of course, uh, and you have some, it's an ex both of them extraordinary plays, but what a turnaround moment. I couldn't write on it, you know, because if I wrote on it, all I would do is try to come up with two or 300 pages worth of, wow, <laughs> wow, look at this. Uh, yeah. And it doesn't, it doesn't align itself. It didn't then, and it doesn't now align itself very well with what we consider <laughs> to be appropriate behavior, you know, which is kind of the whole point. It's yeah. just bad behavior all the way through yeah. done with such incredible poetic precision that you just, it's not, it's really just not of this earth. It doesn't seem to be. I, it, it's so, I mean, I, as I said, I think, you know, your work on Marlowe is so, I was lovely to hear you talk, talk about it. And the, the comparison actually with those, um, 
with those sort of male psyche kind of movies, big <laughs> movies, is really it's a really striking one, which I hadn't sort of thought before. Yeah, I mean Marlowe is a genius, isn't he? And what would the uh there's all that um investigation and sort of conspiracy about his death and and how that happened but really the main thing about that is you know the main sort of what if would be you know what what if marlow had, had continued because all of marlow's work i mean I, I can't remember who i who 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 said this and it may even have been you tom but um all of marlow's work is what if he had uh lived a sort of normal span of 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 years would be called juvenilia yeah, yeah. you know this is or all work from you know, is it's so early, uh, so 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 such youthful work. It's it was extraordinary to think what what he would have done. And as lots of people have pointed out, Shakespeare and Marlowe born in the same year. Uh, you know, if it had been Shakespeare who had died yeah. uh, in Deptford at that point, we, I mean, we we wouldn't really have looked at that gathering of work, would we? And said, yeah. what an amazing talent this is. Whereas Marlowe's uh, burns so brightly. It's you're absolutely right. Yeah, uh, it does. And I, I'm going to make this public. I was recently contacted. I won't name names, but I was recently contacted by a scholar who said, I've done a uh, uh, textual analysis, digital analysis of these works and just basically said, Marlowe didn't write Marlowe mm -hmm. and uh, kind of wanted my approval. And I said, mm -hmm. no, well, but, you know, um, knock yourself out, do what you're doing. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, was, uh, I sort of demurred, maybe. And then I mm -hmm. saw something else in a most obscure kind of publication where it uh, someone was saying, I uh, using my work, he made this uh, point. And I never said that. I, I, mm -hmm. There was a, a distance that I had doing reception theory, of course, and I'm staying away from the, the poetry pop, uh, mm -hmm. proper for, for reasons of that, you know, that it's very difficult to... Uh, to come up with the thesis, uh, you know, that, that Mar Marlowe so, uh, but I, I mean, it's interesting how Marlowe was remade and that sort of thing, but I never said that. And uh, I do wonder what we would have, you know, it's the kind of thing that you wonder with, uh, with uh, any number, you know, Hendrix or, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, I don't think we would have gotten that much more out of Jim Morrison, actually, but we 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 would have gotten a lot more out of Hendrix. I, I think that's probably a little bit more accurate, and that uh, they they weren't about to stop. They, mm -hmm. they they had, you can just tell, just a, a world more in in them, but that there there was excess with that that you don't find in Shakespeare. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you find the artist and uh, there, there is excess in Marlowe mm -hmm. that, and that, that same excess, however, he reached his end, you know, uh, mm -hmm. was, was part of that, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the wrong mm -hmm. place, uh, wrong place, mm -hmm. wrong time, wrong people. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, we could talk about Marlowe for forever and ever. We could talk about all of these things all day. Forever and ever. Uh, I did want to come back to Twelfth Night. I'm teaching in a second language situation, and I'm teaching uh, advanced English students, you know, third and fourth year and graduate students, and their English is good. And mm -hmm. we have to approach it, uh, you know, you could do far more material in one of your classes, but if I go slowly, uh, you know, the lights are on and uh, the, uh, there's wattage there, but we have to go as you, as if, you know, you were studying um, uh, a French novelist, you know, in yeah. my case, I, it would take me quite a long time. And yeah. uh, so I can do Midsummer Night's Dream and I can explain the comedy to the, to a degree, but Twelfth Night just absolutely, uh, I'm, I'm famoxed. I tried to teach it last uh, in our last term and uh, those exchanges, uh, you know, between the uh, comic characters uh, in there, uh, Egu Cheek and so forth, and then Feste comes in with these, uh, you know, obtuse observations, mm -hmm. and every now and then just nails it with one line, mm -hmm. and it, it's just, it's just hard. It's harder than Hamlet mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> to teach. So I don't know if you've found that to be the case. I've just found it. And it's a, a absolutely brilliant play. Hmm. That's a, well. That's interesting. I mean, it's really hard to grind through comic material, anyway, isn't it? And sort of, you know, trying to work out what's what's funny. Do any of the do any of the productions help? Does the Trevor Nunn 
It, oh, the travel nun is wonderful. It is yeah. wonderful the way that's done. I think it's beautifully done. I love. I it. think it's well done too, yeah. isn't it? And it and it it sort of makes that upstairs downstairs element of it, which is quite an important element of the sort of stratification of the humor. It makes that more legible. I think, and I think more so in the age of Downton Abbey, it's a bit it's a bit sort of clearer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, I I do sometimes use that use that film to. Um, it's good on the tone, isn't it? And the, the sort of the tone of the um, that rather depraved, uh, sort of exhausted kind of partying that they're doing, I think is 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 very well is well captured and sort of works yeah. with the the all that bittersweet sort of um, feeling of of the, of the play. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm with you on that, and I think actually. Uh, I think it's the same with um, uh, te teaching here, um, which needs to go through sort of every scene. You know, that's that, that's that's what you, you you need to you need to work through to um, bring out what's going on and help sort of check in about sort of levels of understanding and so on. And I suppose I'm in a lucky position that I don't actually do much of that kind of teaching. We sort of take that as read. And then we're yeah. able to sort of pick out the bits that are interesting or that echo with other plays or something. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't yeah. actually, it's the, it's the thing I do more in the rehearsal room, actually, when people turn to me and say, what does this mean? Why is this yeah. funny? And quite yeah. often, I, I just, I don't know. I don't I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, this, this is my world. This is my world. And we're with yeah. the people who are uh, traditionally very precise. And yeah. they're and wanting and, and making notes and and wanting to translate in some case, you know, trying to put frame it in a way that they understand. Yeah. And of course, the larger dynamics there, the officiousness, Malvolio's officiousness, and so forth. And and uh this, see, I, I have a list of papers I probably will never write, but I wanted to write one at some point about over punishment in Shakespeare, where you uh and Malvolio's one of one of the yeah. uh top. You know, I think uh, uh, Shylock, or you get a feeling of that with Shylock, yeah. certainly, yeah. Uh, that that people are, it's overdone. And I think it uh, uh, is, is purposeful that, yeah. you know, you're left with the feeling of uh, not self-loathing, but, you, I, you know, I kind of enjoyed that too much. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. It, it's, yes. Yeah. I wonder about that with what you will. You know, oh, yes. it, it just is that sort of turning it back on us and saying, "Well, you know, you 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 egged us on to this. It's you, you know, the audience has bears some responsibility for how the play proceeds because if you if you endorse certain kinds of behaviors by laughing, then we'll just do more. We'll do more and more. That's right. That's right. And we'll put this guy in it. You know, we'll, we'll basically drive him nuts and and throw yeah. him into a, a what you know our little version of bedlam." Yeah. Uh, which is yeah. just hard is that yeah. horrible yeah absolutely. well before i before we get off i wanted to go a little bit uh, i i like to talk about uh turning and transformational moments in the in the lives of critics and uh scholars uh like you and you know if you're if you're comfortable with it i want you know when did young emma say okay it's probably not going to be a degree in engineering it probably won't be a degree in math degree in mass or or history or whatnot you know, what point did you say, okay, I'm going to do this? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, as always, as probably most of your guests on this, as always a reader and a kind of bookish uh, child, I think I thought I would be a novelist. That's what I really wanted to do. Um, so there was never really a question, I think, that I would think that I would take another subject more seriously than I took sort of reading. I must say that when I went to study English at university, I didn't actually really understand what the professional study of literature was. Mm -hmm. I thought it was just reading a lot. <laughs> and I thought, you know, why, why, you know, how wonderful. I didn't, I didn't, I had never read, I know some people um, do in their, in their school, you know, advanced school years in, in the English system, read, you know, have a sense what, what scholarly work is or what critical theories there are or methodologies some some of my students come with that yeah. uh having done that um you know in interesting ways we didn't we didn't do that at all i had i don't think i had a single critical sort of quotation in my study of 
uh, Anthony and Cleopatra, which was one of my uh, A level, my sort of uh, end of uh, school texts. Uh, that wasn't that wasn't the world. So 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 th what the sort of professional work of English studies is was quite was quite a shock to me. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that I thought I had the experience, which I think a lot of students do, and I think my own students have it now, of suddenly realising, OK, it's sort of not what I think that matters. That's not what I'm being asked to do. You know, in some ways I'm being asked to survey this material and and weigh it up, weigh up these different views and come to something. And I, and I felt a disappointment about that, I suppose. And I think it's only it's only quite an advanced level of our world, isn't it? That allows you back to that sense that you can sort of, you know, you can say what you think. That's right. That's right. Because, I remember, we don't allow our students so much to do that. They, they, they're, they're, um, they're a bit more indebted to other things. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, very quickly. I mean, when I first uh, got into the professional part of literary study, I didn't know what what to do and an older friend of mine said go down to the mla bibliography read back five five to ten years and there will be an argument there'll be a debate that surfaces just from the titles and then mm -hmm. go to the articles and then go and uh deliver both sides and then take a side yourself or modify mm -hmm. both both critics mm -hmm. and I, I was fabulously successful just doing that it was it, it yep. worked in, with everybody and then I got into a class with the American poet, and he's a little bit maligned because he's very, I mean, you talk about uh, images of toxic mas masculinity, but uh, James Dickey, and of course the movie Deliverance, which was a part of that canon of movies I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, I took a class with him because he was a Pulitzer Prize winner, you know, nationally known, internationally known. And I thought this is going to be wild because he was known to drink too much and, you know, to be kind of big. And uh, mm. and he was fat, fabulous. He was absolutely. Mm. And, and I wrote, a, uh, he had his right four papers and I wrote one. He came back and he, he uh, used some bad language. He said, mm -hmm. this, you're, you're better than this. He said, get the poet, read the poems, get the poet and read the poems and, and dig in. And the next time I did, and he taught me how to write, mm. you know, mm. because now I can do both, right? I can, yeah. I can do the critical stuff, right? Mm. But then, you know, uh, coming into contact, genuine contact with, and, and it just, it never entered my mind that I would do anything but uh, read poems from an anthology. But okay. to go to some of these, you know, uh, writers where, you know, just pick up a book, we might do it with Tennyson, but we would never mm -hmm. do it with uh, someone who am I thinking? Edgar Lee Masters in America. You know, you just got mm -hmm. one of her two, you know, just a smatter. Mm -hmm. And you pick up the book and go through and look at them as poets. And you see the massive amount of work and how they were they were just struggling uh, yeah. at, at all times. So uh, I, I wish we could introduce more of that into mm -hmm. the academy, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but <laughs> but when you have somebody like Dickie tell you to do something, yeah, you, that's you, right. You, you do it. <laughs> yeah, you do it. You, do it. Uh, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, so, well, I, you know, I, I, if there's anything else that you have that uh, forthcoming that you want to uh, throw out there or put out there for us to uh, to consider, uh, please do. I wanted to uh, thank you, uh, the, you folks at Hartford College for our summer programs. You know, we haven't been able to do, do them. For so many of our students, uh, it, it's a wonderful experience, but then you have the few that it really does break things down. You know, that J J Japan is uh, is historically xenophobic, you know, the, and provincial in the way that many countries are, and uh, the way that I was when I grew up. And I remember my first visit to uh, the UK and how you know eye-opening it was. And so I have a student now at the Shakespeare Institute, and and that was the door she walked through is that little program for three weeks, you know, to, to gain the confidence. Oh, I can go there, and they won't <laughs> they won't eat me. That's fabulous. You know? I'll pass yeah. that. I'll pass that on if I can, Tom, because our team who do that work are obviously a bit. Um, uh, you know, a bit, a bit gloomy about the it's future. You know, obviously, I haven't done it for two time. two years. Um, it's hard to know how and in what form that will come back. Yeah. Um, yeah. So but more you know, than it, one, more than one example, and that's just from my university. You know, yeah. people that's been a uh, uh, again a transformative experience for them. That's uh, that's, that's great to hear. Really good yeah, to hear. Yeah. yeah well, right. I very much hope that we'll be welcoming you, that we'll be welcoming you back at some at some point. 
Um, well, I, I do too, because I surely do uh, love the, love the uh, you know, the environs of the college mm -hmm. are just uh, so fabulous. And the, the library's right there, right? Yeah. And the, the walks, the, the yeah. wonderful long walks and, you know, on the beautiful summer days, sometimes yeah. it isn't beautiful. And then the pubs. Oh, it's good to be reminded of that. It's not a beautiful, uh, it's, a, it's a rather um, Probably not, not blowy right now. And, uh, <laughs> and gray kind of autumn day here today. Um, yeah, we, we tend to get an idealistic uh, view of Oxford, you know, coming there in August yeah. on, on good years. Maybe we can put know. up some um, uh, ideal, idealized pictures with this, this part of our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we will, yeah. We'll show people and, uh, what we're talking about. Yeah, uh, wonderful, yeah. Emma. Well, uh, as things come out, and it, uh, we can keep this little uh, series going, this started, I told you, is a, a grant for a symposium, and you were uh, shortlisted, uh, in, my, in my view, to, to, to bring over here. Uh, and I hope that at some point in the future, you know, we can do something like that. We can't now, and we don't know now. Uh, and and then this other thing, now I can talk to a lot more people, not yeah. just the short list, a lot more, and, and also earlier career scholars who yeah, are absolutely. so important, you know, uh, and uh, so I want to keep this going, but I also am hoping that one, you know, at one point we can get you over here and you can. Well, meet, that, you know, that would be wonderful, but it, it, and it is absolutely wonderful to be able to use, you know, we've been forced into these technologies, haven't we, but they've got hugely beneficial yeah um you know aspects and and i have had i too have had conversations with people or listened into seminars um online that i would never have gone to or never have been able to go to um and so it's good to hold on to that isn't it amid all the things that have been lost over this period i think yeah. this is a real gain and it's been a real pleasure well uh, we can do both we can do, yeah, both. can do both and yeah. uh and and also if anything comes up and stuff just please do, do not hesitate to contact me and say okay and we don't have to go long form you know we can do something short and say well emma's doing this now and That'd i can send it out to the you know the normal people well if you could just stay i want to uh i want to thank you again so much on behalf of me of course but on behalf of the uh jsps the uh, uh japan society for the promotion of science that uh, helps fund this and also um my uh colleagues and the university aoyama gakuin university for providing support uh, i say that at the beginning of every program but i really want to emphasize it uh here as we talk with you and thank you so much for speaking with us today emma thank you 